in our discussion and reading or studying of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 so far, uh, we've learned that the Apostle Paul is very concerned about division in the church. And he's given us um, several reasons that division occurs. The first one that we talked about was carnality and immaturity that exist in the church. The second we talked about is the elevation of men and a misunderstanding of their ministries. And then uh, lastly, we talked about a misappropriation of glory to men instead of glorifying God. And we get trapped in that in this world. It's, uh, it's something very worldly that goes on in our culture right now to, to elevate people. And I want you to think about that just a minute. What really, when you think about it, is the purpose of Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat? What are we doing? We're promoting ourselves. Okay. We're promoting ourselves. And why are we doing that? Because other people are promoting themselves. The, the people that we idolize are promoting themselves. It, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Let people know about us. Why? So we can feel better about ourselves? So, But what does that invite? I think it invites depression, dishonesty, hatefulness. Um, now there's a lot of good comments, don't get me wrong. Um, and there's a lot of good that can come from social media. But when you think about it at its core, the, the people that are behind the scenes that are the controlling forces of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those things, they're selling us on ourselves. They're, they're selling to our egos. It's a problem. And so in the next few verses, actually the, the rest of the chapter, Paul's going to address that. He gives us three more reasons why there's division in the church. The first is we don't have a correct view of ourselves. We don't have a correct view of ourselves. And how could we? And our heroes, my hero in the football world, Patrick Mahomes, he's got a million followers. Followers. Disciples of Patrick Mahomes. Well, when you think about it, okay, so the first is we have a correct an incorrect view of ourselves. The second is we have the wrong view of each other. And then lastly, we have the wrong view of God. Let's look at our scripture this morning, and then we'll talk about this question on the board. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. What's the correct view of yourself? To the temple of God. Big pressure. Temple of God. That's where God resides. And let no one deceive himself. This is where our egos are all out of whack. If anyone among you thinks he, he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of the world is folly with God, for it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. They are futile. So let no one boast in men. Now he's talking about a view of others. Let no one boast in men. Let's talk about Patrick Mahomes from the pulpit. Maybe a problem. I don't know. We'll talk about that later. But we do. We glorify men and women in this world almost to a godlike status. We, we worship what they do, how they perform, what they say, what they wear, how they look. Our young women don't have a chance 
you know what? We went down to Kansas City this this last week, and we got back last night, and and spent the day with Chloe and the night with Chloe, and we went to a family barbecue that her company puts on every year, and it was at this uh, uh, Faulkner's Ranch, which is in Independence, Missouri. And it's a little petting zoo, and they've got all kinds of fun games to do with your kids and with each other, and so on and so forth. And I looked around at Chloe, and I looked around at all the people that she worked with. And I loved it because a thought came over me. These are ordinary people. There's not any beautiful people here. And I don't mean that in a bad way. There's not any pretty people here. There's not any popular. I don't know these people. I know my daughter. Okay, These were ordinary people. No, no one to idolize until Chloe pointed out who the CEO was, and then I watched him everywhere he went. You know, how's he behaving? What's he doing? That's what happens when we find out somebody has a status. Our, our focus. But then we went around and talked with Chloe's coworkers, and they all made her mother feel very good and her father feel very good. And amazing was the word they used a lot. Not bragging or anything. I'm not trying to elevate Chloe, but we are proud of her. And we're glad that she's at such a good place. But we, we elevate people and we, we compare people. And when we compare people, we can't help but build a hierarchy. This one's the best. This one's the worst. I, I do that when I scan you all. I don't. I don't. I think what a bunch of saints out here. That's what I think. I really do. So not, let no one boast in men. And why is that? Why, why shouldn't you boast in this one and that one and that one and this one? Well, there's many reasons, but Paul says, for all things are yours. Enjoy Patrick Mahomes. Enjoy this one. Enjoy that one. Enjoy this one. They're yours for your enjoyment. And not just them, but all things. All things. A sermon I was listening to, uh, the pastor said that he knew a man who lived next to a 60-acre uh, estate that had a great mansion on it. And it was pretty wide open. It manicured, just beautiful. And he could look every day out his back room window. And he said, that's mine. The owner was only there once a year. But he got to enjoy it every day and walk on the grounds and fully explore. It was his. He didn't own any of it, but it was his. God created the world for us. This world. I mean, I understand that. He said, subdue it. Okay? So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. And he gives the examples again, again of preachers who were all teaching the same message. They were all one in doctrine. There was nothing to differentiate them in what they were preaching about Christ. They were all preaching Christ crucified, whether Paul, Apollos, or Cephas. Well, wait a minute. If there was no difference, why were they elevating one over the other? Peter was Jewish. Paul had an affection for the Gentiles. Apollos was an eloquent speaker. Oh, they loved Apollos. They put personality ahead of what mattered. And they decided, we'll like this one, and we are his camp. We like this one because of this, and we are in his camp. And pretty soon, we don't like you because, and we don't like you because, you can't be in our group, blah, blah, blah. Division in the church. There was no... Distinction in message or doctrine or teaching or preaching. It was all about who they liked based upon personality. All things are yours, whether your teachers or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ and Christ is God's. Let's see. Teachers, the world, life, death, present, or the future. 
I think that covers about everything. So why or how has our perspective or our view as a child of God become distorted? What's happened to us? Scooney just said a little bit ago, Gary, Gary said, who is that? And I was sitting right by him. He, he's having trouble seeing. Okay, I have trouble hearing. He said, who is that? I said, I picked you up this morning. He said, is that Alan? Well, yeah. And that's fine. But see, our vision becomes distorted, not because we can't see well, we can't think well. Our heart is out of whack. Our priorities are messed up. We think we're better than that group because they don't have this or because they have that. We build hierarchies in everything. We look at Instagram and say, oh, she's got the perfect figure. Why can't I be like her? Perfection is not defined by us. Think about that for a minute. We don't define perfection. Why is that? Because none of us is perfect. We have no idea what perfect is. There's only been one perfection. He died on the cross. He rose from the grave, and he's in heaven. Okay, and you can read about him, and you can feel him in your heart, but you can't see it. So if you want to understand perfection, you're going to have to open up this book and study him and learn what perfection is. That's the only way. Facebook's not going to help you in that. Instagram's not going to help you in that. Google is not going to help you in that. Okay, Webster, Merriam Dictionary may tell you what perfection is, but they won't tell you who perfection is. So, how has our perspective, and that perspective it would be perfection, okay, that's the, that's the bar, how has that view as a child of God, as a brother and sister of Jesus Christ, how has our vision become distorted? What do you think? Okay. Wandering eyes. We lose our focus. Just being busy all the time. Huh? Being busy all the time. Busyness. Yeah. Why do we want to be busy, Connie? Yeah, be we want everything to be perfect. And when things are perfect, what's that do for us? Feel good. Feel good. Lust of the flesh. It always comes back to this, guys. It always comes back to these three. Always. What else? Because we want to have our way. The boastful pride of life. We want to be God over ourselves. Now, you're saying, oh, Alan, you're way off on that. Really? How many of you today will do the exact thing that God does not want you to do, but you'll do it because it makes you feel good? Me? But doesn't God know better than me? Yeah. Doesn't he know better than you? Why, why, why? Boastful pride of life. You know what? My prayers have changed over the years. I used to ask God to help me not sin. And I realized that that was pretty futile because I was going to sin. 
I've changed my prayers to asking God to help me be obedient. And I've even defined it since then to God, take my will away. Reduce my will in all of this. We have to remove ourselves. Okay? Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Sin in itself is its own penalty. Think about that. When you sin, you are hurting yourself. When you and I sin, we are actually hurting ourselves. We are suffering the penalty of our wrong choice in the here and now. Eternally, it's paid for. Jesus took care of that. But when we disregard God's will, it hurts us. And we suffer Immediately. Remember last week we read the verse in Matthew 18.6, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. How about those CEOs that are preying on our ego on the Internet? Will they be held accountable? What's their motive? Greed. How about the media that gets us all wound up with all kinds of misinformation and propaganda? Why do they do that? How about those politicians who invest in Pfizer and Moderna and make us take the vaccine? And I'm not anti-vaccine, but they put mandates and they've been guilty of insider trading. But guess what? They can't be prosecuted for insider trading, but we can. How about that? Why? Money, power, greed, corruption. The world's full of it, guys. It's full of it. And we can get drawn into that and prey upon other people. He goes on to say, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. I heard another excellent example. Let's say we have 10 men and women from the community of Putnam County. They all have PhDs. Some is in law science, doctors, education. We have 10 of them start coming to church. Another guy with economics or gal with economics. Wow. What a credit to our church. They know nothing about the Bible. We have another 10 men and women who come in, having graduated high school. Godly people, spiritually led people, biblically literate who are we going to choose to lead us? The PhDs or the dummies? You see, when you choose to follow this, it's completely different than worldly wisdom. It's hard to think about unless we exaggerate it or we can understand. But we should choose the biblic biblically literate, non-educated people to lead us because they're godly. But we wouldn't because they're no good with money. They're no good with community leadership. The town thinks they're idiots. But they're, good to take care of each other. they're godly. Outside in the community, they don't understand. I'm not saying Unionville. Outside in the world... They don't understand godliness. That's dumb. Why would you deny yourself pleasure? Don't you want to feel good about yourself? We have to, we have to make a decision 
And we're all in the process. All of us are. I mean, I'm, I struggle with it every day. Worldliness or godliness? Those people, those PhD fighters have a work system called talent. Yeah. Not, not only do they not know the Bible, but that's, you're talking not only about here in church, I mean, the whole country needs to know people that got yeah. common sense. Yeah. Now, it would be great if we could have 10 PhDs come in that were godly. Now, that's a boom. And that's a massive common Yeah. Get it all again. You bet. Okay. We just need to put some letters behind Nick's name. <laughs> Nick, Michael. I don't need no letters behind my name. Farmer, uh, FHD. Oh. Okay. You know, back, back behind you, on, on, that quick, on that question you asked, there, you know, it, I think we take God for granted. Yeah. I, I think that needs to be put up there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We just take God for granted. Yeah. We have and an incorrect. We don't, we don't have God until we get in the bind. We have an incorrect view of God. Okay. Is he almighty or is he just kind of handy? We will pull him out of our pocket in time of need, like a Swiss Army knife. Or are we going to let him control our hearts? We'll get to that. I'm glad you brought that up. Because I get really sidetracked if you don't keep me on. He says, let no one deceive himself. So deceive themselves. John MacArthur says in his study Bible, he says, those who defile the church and think they can seek, succeed in destroying it by their human wisdom would be far better to reject that wisdom and accept the foolishness of Christ's cross. We talked about the foolishness of the cross, or the word of the cross. The word of the cross is God's total revelation to us. So, so what do we know? What has God shared with us? He shared the gospel in all its fullness, which includes the incarnation of Jesus, and the crucifixion of Jesus, the entire plan and provision for redeeming sinners. He's told us. This is how it works. You believe in my son and you trust him. Really? That's it? But the world says, that's stupid. That's folly. Folly. Remember that word in the Greek translates moron. That's moronic. That's moronic. God's total re revelation also tells us about those who are perishing and those who are being saved. Every person is either in the process of salvation or they're in the process of destruction. There's, there's, you can't ride the fence, okay, one way or another. One response to the cross of Christ determines which side of the fence you're on. One decision. That's all you got to do. To the Christ rejectors who are in the process of being destroyed, the gospel is nonsense. It's nonsense. To those who are believers, it's powerful wisdom. So the PhDs that are biblically illiterate, that's dumb. Okay, let's make this a corporation and a legitimate business. Let's do some fundraising. Okay, they come in here and make us a lottery program, a money maker. The dummies that know the Bible say, hey, let's sing some hymns and do some praying. Hold each other accountable and support one another in this walk together. So Paul, he quotes um, 
Job 5.13 and Psalm 94.11, reminding them that human wisdom, which cannot save, also cannot either build a church or prevent its growth. Okay? Human wisdom can't stop us. You get that? This world cannot stop us. How do I know that's true? Because Jesus says that the gates of Hades would not overwhelm us. For secure. Okay? That's kind of where I come up with some of my millennial views, which we're not going to get into, but I fully believe that Jesus is coming back to take us out of here if we're all still living. We're going to be transformed like that. And if we're in the grave, we're going to rise up and meet our new bodies. Okay? In Job 5.13, he says, He catches the wise in their own craftiness, and the schemes of the wily are brought to a quick end. Psalm 94.11 says, The Lord knows the thoughts of man. They're but a breath. So then Paul changes the subject from us to our view on others. On others. I'm kind of, we kind of mixed that in a little bit as we went, the 10 and the 10 and all of that. He says, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. And he used Paul and Apollos and Cephas. And he says, all others receive no credit for the building of the church. All things are yours. So, this church is not the product of Alan. This church is not the product of your next preacher. This product, this church is not the product of Jim, Ronnie, Nick, Gary, and all you fine ladies. It's not. This is Jesus' church. This is Jesus' church. But all things are yours. And what that means is we all share equally in God's most important and valuable provisions and glories. We share in it. Nobody's more important than anybody else. It's all ours. Human boasting, elevating me, elevating the next teacher is ludicrous and it's sinful. It doesn't build up this church. You know, Don't go out and say you need to go to church because Alan's there. Say, come to our church because there's a lot of love and a lot of fellowship and we talk about the truth and we praise God together. And it's like a family. Sell that. Don't sell me. You won't have anybody here. Okay? So our, our view of being, of who we are, uh, it needs correction. And in this wrong view of other people, we need to understand this idea that everything is ours. I thought it was kind of complicated. So I'm going to try to be plain spoken with you about it. All right, the world, he says, whether Paul, Apollo, Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future, all are yours. All of this is promised to us. The world. The world, the system, the evil, the cosmos in the Greek. That world is controlled by Satan, but the earth was created for us. And that's the world that Paul is talking about here. It's still the God-given and God-made possession of Christians. It's ours. Subdue and rule. That's what God said to Adam and Eve. Subdue and rule. You may think, well, that sounds a little harsh. Subdue and rule. To subdue just means, I think, gentle control. 
doesn't mean to enslave, to subdue. And to rule just means to simply take care of. Take care of, be in charge of. Kind of like tending a herd of cattle. Okay, You're in charge of that. We're to tend to the people of the world. We're in charge of that. And the reason that this is all for our sake is so that the grace that we enjoy can extend to everyone else. We, we don't want to hoard the grace. It's all ours, so let's go share it. It's ours to share. Listen, grace is the greatest gift that you and I have ever been given. It's unmerited favor. It's a pardon for all of this stuff. We're still going to suffer with it while we live in the flesh, but eternally the mistakes we have made are forgiven because of grace provided by the blood of Christ. I'll ask you a stupid question. Do you not love your family and your neighbors who don't know Christ? Of course you do. So why would you want to hoard grace and not share that with them? It all comes back again to a simple message, to a simple decision. And and so many times, gosh, I've seen it lately a lot, kind of brings tears to my eyes in a way, but so many times we wait until the imminent is near. And I'm not saying that deathbed confessions are invalid, okay? I don't even want to go there because I don't know. What I'm saying is, is why not allow people to enjoy grace as long as they can, not till the last days of their life, Grace frees us from the bondage of sin. Not just in eternity, but now. Paul tries to help us understand, oh, that means we're licensed to sin. We can sin more. No, heavens no, he says. But you don't have to feel like you're going to hell all the time anymore. Because you're not. So you can be happy and rejoice in Jesus for what he's done. That's the simple message of grace. You're not going to hell anymore. I don't know about you, but that's a big deal for me. So I went a little long on the world. Life talks about all are yours. The world, the life, or death, or the present, or the future. Life. He's talking about spiritual, eternal life. In John 14, 23, Jesus says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. <laughs> Peter says, in his second epistle, chapter 1, verse 3, he says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Look how those are linked together. Real life comes from godliness. Godliness is not our quality. It's the quality given to us. We don't in inherently have it. It's imputed and imparted to us. You can look those up. I don't know how it works. But it's given to us freely. Like grace. And then we practice godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. By which he has granted us his precious and very great promises. So that through them you may become partakers of divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. This does not have to enslave you anymore. 
It doesn't. You now have within you the ability to choose another option. You're not enslaved by the flesh anymore or your desires. You have godliness imparted into you. You have holiness living in you. You now have a voice in your head saying, no, let's not go there. Let's not say that. Am I the only one that has a voice in his head? Good. Thought I was going crazy. Sometimes it's my voice. And I hear my own voice telling me that. Sometimes it's Wendy's. And I'm like, oh, okay, sorry. No, no it's never Wendy's. It's usually my voice, but lately it's like not my voice. So I don't know what's going on. May have to see a shrink. Not a good idea. Because he'd say, there's a pill for that. Death is ours. Death is ours. What would the world say about death? Not good. What do we say about death? <sighs> Summerland. For it's no night. Right? Look, my kids are old enough now. Wendy and I have been married long enough now. And I mean that in all good ways, by the way. That the Lord took me, that's okay. Right? Isn't that how you all feel at this point in your life? If we breathe our last, it's going to be better. It's going to be better. So death, spiritual and internal death, there's two differences. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 says, when the perishable puts on imperishable. Remember, Paul talks about taking off the old dirty clothes and putting on new garments. All right? That's how he talks about salvation. We, we get rid of our old garments that are soiled and nasty, and we put on fresh garments. That's kind of what he's saying. We... When, when the perishable, our flesh, puts on imperishable, when we are saved, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. He's saying, should I live or die? Because if I live, I get, to, I get to share the gospel with more people. If I die, I get to go be with Jesus. Which should I do? I cannot decide between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. He was telling the church at Philippi, my living is more important so I can teach you. And then the present. Every believer has or has had experiences in this life. All of us have, good and bad. Listen to what Paul says to the church in Rome in chapter 8, starting in verse 37. Know in all things, in all these things, everything, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angel, angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing in this world that can separate you from the love of Christ, in a nutshell. That's what Paul's telling us. The future. 
What is the future? All the blessings of heaven. Can I describe it? Not so much. Um, you can read, I believe it's Revelation 20 and 21, and, and get a better glimpse. Um, but all the blessings of heaven. Peter says in chapter 1, verse 3 of his first epistle, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. We have an inheritance awaiting us that will never go away, that will never fade, that will never rot. It's imperishable. And now, lastly, and I don't mean for this to be the short one, but it's a short verse, verse 23. And you are Christ, and Christ is God, is God's. What's that mean? MacArthur says that knowing that believers belong to Christ and therefore to one another is the greatest incentive for unity in the church. Listen to that again. Knowing that believers belong to Christ and therefore to one another is the greatest incentive for unity in the church. We all realize that we're equal partners. We're all equal shareholders in the glory and the grace of Christ. That none of us is better than the other. We all realize that. We should have no problem with unity. But when we start elevating Cindy, because she has such a pleasant personality, and Cindy is great, and Cindy this, and Cindy that, we start getting into trouble. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verses 1, going through verse 4. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort in love or from love, as David says, is the greatest thing, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy, Paul says, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. That's where we get into problems, pride problem. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also into the interests of others. You know what may have been my most important job this morning? It was not to get up here and preach to you all. It was probably to give two of my friends a ride to church today. Who may have not heard a word, but enjoyed some company, and some fellowship, and some cinnamon rolls. Let's not elevate what we do either. Okay? Sometimes I feel really, really, it, this week has been that way, and I don't know why, but sometimes I just feel so inadequate. Um, I think maybe an unworthy because I, 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 when I preach to you all, I preach to myself, and sometimes it really hurts, you know, because you gotta, you got to face the truth. If you're going to share the truth, you got to face the truth. I don't know how these imposters and false prophets or whatever, fake teachers, I don't know how they do it. And when, when their ambition is money and, and, and they're up here sharing the truth, I just I don't know how they do it. I think I would die a thousand deaths in my heart. But uh, this week... 
Um, I, I want to ask you for a special prayer. A Tuesday is the day for me. Um, I go back to the surgeon, and hopefully he'll release me to go back to work. And after church next Sunday, I intend to head out, get back to work. So I would appreciate a prayer there. Um, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning and uh, for your word and the truth that it provides us. Uh, we would be a boat drifting in some heavy waves without an anchor or oars if it weren't for your word. Father, this, this world is so turbulent. We, uh, we hit the waves. When we're walking on land, we hit all kinds of obstacles. We bounce off them. We're to and fro. But like the Bible says, like Paul says, we're, we're hard-pressed, not shaken. We, we have every confidence, Father, that the saving work of Jesus has been accomplished. He said so. He demonstrated it. He made everything he said come true. All of his predictions about his resurrection. I told the apostles that when he left, a helper would come. And we know that's true because we understand and feel the Holy Spirit in, in each one of us. Helping us through this life make decisions that are beyond our ability to make on our own. Father, thank you for all these saints that are here this morning, their devotion to um, the love and ministry of this church, uh, the love for each other. Uh, I thank you, Father, for just the provision that you have provided us to do the repairs that have been needed, the improvements that have been needed. And, uh, I'm, we're, we're thankful for Jill for all she does behind the scenes. Um, organizing and taking care of it. And she's not the only one. I, I know I'm leaving other people out. Um, Father, it takes all of us um, to make this church. But help us realize that there is no church without your son Jesus. And it's at this time that we remember why we're assembled. Um, we remember the agony and the awfulness of Calvary and how he willingly embraced all of that, even to the point of forgiving those that were persecuting him, even to the point of giving grace to a thief that was on the cross for, with him, who had just previously hurled insults at him. Even in his death, Jesus showed us mercy, humility, and grace. So we're grateful for that. We love you, Father, and again, we thank you for this day that you set aside for us to come together and worship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.